Uh, well, congratulations. You've done well to make it to uh, the 5 p.m. closing slot. Um, we'll try to make this as engaging as possible and on point as possible so, that, so as not to delay um, everyone's arrival at the Earthworm Arms, I'm sure. Um, I'll be looking forward to um, a beverage myself. So uh, we have a panel for today on the topic of reducing nitrogen inputs. And uh, how we're going to kind of flow this session is, uh, I'm just going to say a few things to kick off. Then we'll hear from each of our three uh, farmer panelists, Andy Howard, Tim Parton, and Doug Christie. Uh, after that, I've got a selection of very brief, uh, just kind of pinpoint, bullet point, couple of comments um, case studies from Twitter. So I put out a, a post on Twitter and asked for to hear what farmers are doing and many replied. So I'm just going to share a few quick stories from Twitter. Uh, then we will slide into having a bit of a discussion about well, whatever comes up in the next um, 30 odd minutes. We'll see. Uh, we'll have a quick discussion of that and then open open that up for to the floor uh, to, to hear um, from you guys to ask questions to our panelists. Uh, let's keep a little discussion based. Very happy. It's not too busy in the room. So very happy for us to um, have some time for a discussion there. Uh, at the end, and, um, and equally from any of you in the audience. I mean, some of you might not have seen my tweet. If you've got something to tell, if you have a case study that belongs up here that we haven't happened to end up discussing, um, please chime in in the, in the final question and discussion there. If you've just got a contribution to make of, of something that you've done that we haven't covered that doesn't come up, please share it. I want to hear equally from your perspectives, the farmers out there in the audience right now, as, as well as our, our uh, couple up on stage. So, so please do chime in and make this um, uh, an inclusive kind of discussion. So let's get started. The reason that um, this topic comes up, of course, is that nitrogen is, uh, our nitrogen inputs, of course, are notoriously reactive in the soil and in the environment. And we typically see nitrogen use efficiencies hovering around this 50 odd percent mark. Okay, you know, it, it ebbs and flows 40 to 60 percent. You hear all sorts of different figures. But really, there's a lot of uh, kind of studies have been done on this. There's a lot of evidence that supports this kind of overall figure of around about 50 percent. Uh, nitrogen use efficiencies. So clearly, all that very states to me very clearly is that there's a lot of opportunity for us to to do better, to improve what we're doing. Now, are we ever going to get one to 100% efficiency? Prob probably not. No, but there's plenty of room for improvement. Is how I interpret that number. Hence, why the suggestion to put together this kind of topic uh, and this panel discussion today. So. Nitrogen is a big issue in the environment. It's not only from an economic point of view and optimizing your profitability on the farm. Of course, this reactive nitrogen that is highly leachable, highly volatilizable, it enters into the ecosystem where it can cause a lot of ecosystem degradation. And so there was a study here just published um, in 2017 uh, looking at the nitrates down, the nitrate leaching, and particularly the reservoirs down in our groundwaters and down in our bedrock. And we see these kind of um, media lines like this one here, scale of the nitrate time bomb revealed. There's a significant reserves of nitrates down in the bedrock that are working their way down, uh, progressively um, ultimately ending up in our in our uh, groundwaters and water systems, et cetera. So particularly from the point of view of nitrates, there's a very strong and direct concern about the effects of these in the ecosystem. So again, another good reason why we should be having this discussion. It's good for your economics, and it will be good for the environment if we can begin this process of uh, improving those efficiencies and minimizing those leachings and, and nitrogen losses. So, and this is kind of the global picture. This is what we see. The red is the real hot spots. This is specifically looking at nitrate leaching again, just on this particular topic. And you can see the real hot spots here in North America, uh, Western Europe, and um, various parts of Asia. There are kind of the real hot spots of the nitrogen leaching. And so, this is the problem that we face. You can see it's a rather significant problem, a global problem, uh, and definitely something that is, of course, on the agenda. Uh, it is on the agenda. There's, there's a lot of conversations around this, but um, lots, there, lots of room for improvement that we need to do. 
And I think part of this discussion involves, or part of this problem, I think, that we see this, um, such, a, such an eminent problem that we see is that, you know, we've been drilled this idea about, you know, plants taking up nitrogen and that they take up the nitrate and ammonium form. And, you know, all of our learning, all of our thinking, all of our nutrient management, it's dominated in this, these two pieces of the puzzle. Oh, how do we optimize these? How do we manage these? The role of these two nutrients in plant nutrition. There's such a, a dominant kind of narrative around nitrate and ammonium. But plants use all other sorts of nitrogen as well, organic sources of nitrogen, amino acids, indeed, they do absorb, proteins they absorb, I mean, urea, of course, is another compound that they also absorb, that they can use as part of plant nutrition. So opening up this dialogue and including some of the missing pieces, amino acids, proteins, and how they fit into the picture is also got to be as part of, part of the dialogue and part of the discussion. And of course, it comes down to then the obvious things, nitrogen fixation, legumes. So we, there's a lot of opportunity there for the use of legumes. I'm sure this will come up now in our discussion. But some you know, basic things like making sure that we have the right uh, species of uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria and the right rhizobium species matched to the right crop. Um, you know, so there are some fundamentals there that we can be looking out for. And also then thinking about some of the other factors that govern nitrogen fixation. Of course, nitrogen fixation being a critical tool that we can use in this story. Um, and understanding the role of nutrition and the minerals which help the, the nitrogen fixation process. So the role of molybdenum, iron and nickel, you know, three trace minerals which have a direct and specific role for the bacteria. They need those three minerals to make the enzymes that help them grab the nitrogen and convert it and deliver it to the plants. So I feel like I'm standing in front of everybody here. Molybdenum, iron, nickel we should definitely be on our radar. And I'm not talking for the plants, I'm talking for the bacteria, do the bacteria have enough molybdenum, iron, and nickel? And okay, if we move on to uh, then legumes specifically, the first three I'm talking about nitrogen fixation across the board. But then if we move into legumes, uh, well, for rhizobia, calcium also really important, boron also really important, cobalt, copper, phosphorus. All of these minerals are critically required by the bacteria in order for them to deliver this job. So the question is, are we managing these? Are these constraints to nitrogen fixation? And in some instances, they may well be. Are they holding back the potential of that free nitrogen? And of course, we then need to go beyond that and, and, re and of course remember that, well, it's not just legumes that fix nitrogen. All plants can indeed fix nitrogen through their associations with free-living nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Bacteria that don't have to form the nodules and associate with legumes, but bacteria that will happily uh, hibernate, live around the root system of any plant and receive the sugars and root exudates in exchange for fixing nitrogen. This was one study here just published last year, a fascinating one, uh, identifying this particular um, variety of maize, a land race of maize come from uh, cultured by the native peoples in Mexico in these very low nitrogen soils. They've been seed saving for, for many uh, successive generations. And so over time, the plant has evolved to develop these aerial roots, and what the study last year showed is that these, um, the maize here is exuding this very specific mucilage, those root exudates you can see, uh, covering those aerial roots. They develop these aerial, aerial roots and, and excrete this specific food source that recruits the free-living nitrogen-fixing bacteria. So the, the maize itself is certainly forming that association with the free-living, and it has evolved these specific roots and specific root exudates to facilitate that process. As the study showed, this particular variety of maize has the ability to fix anywhere from 30 up to 80% of its total nitrogen requirements through the bacteria, through the symbiotic fixation. Okay, so it's not just legumes. We also need to think about how we can optimize this process for other plants as well. Okay, so I just want to set the scene there. Um, this is our topic. Um, we'll now, this is not really about me at all. I really want this to be about the farmers. I want to hear from the farmers. We want to have this discussion here. So I just wanted to lay the story there. And now if we can invite our first panelist up, um, Andy Howard will be kicking off first to share some of uh, his experiences. Then we'll hear from Tim and uh, Doug after that. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, please. For those who don't know me, just to set the scene, I am a farmer from Kent, um, family farm. Just clicked through a couple of times. Um, 
worked with mum and dad on the farm. Um, we've been no-till for since 2011 and strip-till since 2007. Most None of our farms seen a plough since uh, 2001. Um, I don't actually know how to plough, so that's a good start. Um, we grow a wide variety of crops and some intercrops as well, which I'll talk about in a minute. And we also grow cover crops as well um, over winter. Um, yep. So just about five years ago when Joel, well, I started working with Joel on the farm, we, so I've got to the stage where my yields are probably staying the same, but my costs were going up. I was doing all this biological stuff, I was all still, still doing all the chemical stuff. Um, <clears throat> so I came to the decision that we need to reduce our inputs. So four years ago, we decided to gradually, 10% every year, reduce our inputs. So we're now in year four. So in terms of nitrogen, I'm using now 40% less nitrogen on my crops. And I'll explain how in a minute. We've also reduced insecticides. I've just done one three, one three hectare field of insecticide this year on linseed and fungicides, we're down below 50% of what we were before. So those two have been relatively easy. The nitrogen is a bit more fluid and not quite so easy to manage. <clears throat> but what I will say, what I'm gonna talk about, as Joel said, there's no magic bullet to this. What I base everything we do on is, is a balanced soil, healthy soil leading to a healthy plant, which then doesn't need all the interventions including nitrogen. And in my understanding, nitrogen is the driver of disease. Nitrogen is the driver of insect pressure. So a lot of the problems we have in our cropping is because we put far too much nitrogen on, in my opinion. Um, so now I've started to reduce those things, we see our less, less disease pressure, less stress in the plant. Um, there's many ways that I try to reduce our nitrogen inputs. Um, and this slide normally takes about half an hour when I'm doing talks, so I'll have to quickly whiz through them. And hopefully we can sort of tease out more detail in the discuss discussion afterwards. One of the first thing, as I said, is enc encouraging soil biology. <clears throat> um, and the growing your own cover crops. So I feel the cover crops, we're keeping the nitrogen in the system. So people say to me, are cover crops worth growing? I say, well, the studies done by Kings reckon that you save about, you don't lose about 70 kilograms of N per hectare over winter if you had bare fallow. So that's 70, 70 kilos for me is then in the system for my spring barley, spring oats. So yes, in terms of nitrogen, cover crops are definitely worth growing just by getting that root in to hold it. I don't believe that cover crops necessarily fix much nitrogen, but I think they're more of a scavenger. So that's another method. Intercropping, which is my pet subject, I did enough of a scholarship on it, and I'll talk a bit more about it in a minute on my last slide, because <clears throat> it's one, the one thing I think eventually, once we've worked all the nuances out, will be the thing that will really mean we will be able to reduce our nitrogen, um, just by using the symbi symbiotic relationships between plants. <clears throat> Living mulch, which this is, if you were here for Frederick Thomas, he was talking about growing um, a permanent understory of alfalfa, lucerne, or clover. We have done this, we have tried it, not always very successfully. Um, we're still learning how to do it. But the guy I saw in France had cut his nitrogen in half just by having lucerne growing with his crop for four years in the bottom, and he just cropped normally on top. And he also he'd eliminated need for fungicides. So once we got this one sorted of knowing how to do it, I believe it can really benefit, um, help us reduce nitrogen. Monitor plant levels. <clears throat> so our next slide will show you throughout the growing season, um, about every week I'm going through the crop, doing things like bricks, um, sap pH, but also checking for nitrogen level. I've got one of those Yara handheld end testers. Um, which I find gives me a good guide. Um, it highlights interesting things. For example, the common thought is after spring oats or after for a second wheat, you need more nitrogen. Well, I found in our system, with using this end tester, there's absolutely no difference whether it's a first wheat, second wheat, 
wheat after oats, wheat after beans, wheat after oilseed rape, the nitrogen was exactly the same. So I didn't need that extra 30 kilograms of N that apparently you're supposed to need. So that gave me good guidance of um, the levels in my crops at that time. And I do use it to tweak nitrogen levels throughout the growing season. Um, but it's also shown me, as I've reduced my nitrogen by 10% every year, that this year our nitrogen status are exactly the same as they were two years ago in our wheat crops, but I've used 20% less nitrogen. So, you know, it gives me confidence that we're going in the right direction. I'm sure we'll make mistakes. Um, but, you know, it's, our efficiency is going up. I also think, I don't know what Joel thinks, but I also think nitrogen is a bit of a drug for the soil. The more you use, the more you need. You've got to sort of wean your soil off nitrogen, and those things like the mycorrhizae, the um, free, living, free living bacteria will start to come back and will start to fill that gap. I'm not saying you can go 100% off, but I'm sure that's what's happening, because what we're doing is encouraging the healthy soil. <clears throat> we also brew up um, biologicals that go in with the seed. So for nitrogen fixes, we'll brew up um, the day before planting for 24 hours. It'll be in an IBC with a, an air pump, and that costs us about 10 pound, a, uh, no, five pound a hectare, and we should get at least 30 kilograms of N from that, and maybe 100. A bit like all these things, there's quite a wide range of what you might get. So that's another strategy we use is by mixing up. Um, trichoderma and things, and things like trichoderma also are good at fungal diseases in your, in your soil as well. So it's a two, there's a two-way thing going on there, and it's five pound a hectare. For me, it's cheap and, and simple. Um, we also, especially for our spring crops, we place nitrogen in the soil next to the seed. Things like urea, disappear up in, the, up in the air, especially in the dry spring. So we've managed to cut our nitrogen usage on spring barley, for example, by 30% just by putting it next to the seed. Um, quite a simple thing, but we have got the correct drill for doing it. Um, but it makes, you know, it all happens in the dry spring. You plant your spring barley, then it doesn't rain for two months, and you broadcast your nitrogen, it just sits there. Um, by putting it next to the seed, it's quite a simple way of improving your nitrogen efficiency. And one of the things that Joel came to the farm with was mixing our, um, well, there's two things there actually, foliar nitrogen. So foliar nitrogen is much more efficient than broadcast nitrogen, but you can't get enough in, so you can't replace the whole amount of foliar, the whole amount of nitrogen through foliars, but you can make a certain proportion more efficient. Um, is it three to six times more efficient going through the leaf? About that. About that. Um, so we do that at, say in wheat, we'll do a little bit at T1, a little bit at T2, and a little bit at T3. And all that doing is just keeping those le levels up. Um, another, another strategy we use. And the last one is the mixing with carbon. So when you put nitrogen on, it will immediately want to associate use carbon from your soil um, or burn off carbon with your soil and you risk losing the nitrogen. So if you mix, we mix our nitrogen with boron humates, which is hopefully you get less volatilization and you get less leaching. And the research shows about 30% better efficiency of your broadcast nitrogen. And if you're doing liquid nitrogen, you can use um, things like Boost who, with Georgia here, again, to increase the efficiency of your fertilizer you're actually applying. Quite simple things to do um, with nitrogen when you're applying it. And we do do a little bit of variable rate. Um, I've got a cheap three grand sensor I bought 10 years ago that I put on the front of the sprayer. But um, it's uh, like most variable rate, our spreader goes 24 meters. So it's not that precise. So it's just really altering it across the field, not to, well, I wouldn't call it precise. Um, these are the meters I use. Um, that's it. That's the middle one is for nitrogen. I find it useful. It is quite expensive, but I think they've just bought a new one out. What I would wish they'd do is they do algorithms for spring crops and for other crops. It's very limited to winter wheat and winter barley, but I find it very useful. It's paid for itself many times over. 
And the last one I wanted to talk about was the intercropping. <clears throat> so this was a field of peas and oilseed rape, which I grew two years ago. It had no fertilizer. And this is a tissue analysis from the oilseed rape. And apart from the potash, which we're all normally low with anyway, it's got plenty of nitrogen because it's associated with the peas, but I haven't applied any. And again, this year we're growing winter, uh, spring beans and spring, um, spring oats, and there's more nitrogen in our spring oats with the, that are mixed with the spring beans than my oats that have had 80 kilograms of nitrogen placed with the seed. So there's something going on when you start mixing plants, and it means that they can access nitrogen and all the other things Joel talked about, the nickel and everything. There's some symbiosis going on that I don't think we all quite understand, but it does highlight that you don't need lots of nitrogen to get healthy nitrogen status in your plants. And I think that's me. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. First slide, please. I'm farm manager at Brood Park Farm. We're a 300 hectare farm, um, growing a wide variety of cereals as wide as I can. Um, I try to grow what's best for the soil, but also what we can make some money out of, hopefully. We do a lot of haylage for horses, um, so I like to keep grass in the rotation. Um, not to repeat too much what Andy says, I too do a lot of bricks readings. I use the pH and I use a nitrogen tester, always trying to keep that balance and just keep crops as balanced as we can. Um, I use liquid fertilizer and I always put a carbon source with it. I'm always trying to grow as much nitrogen as I can, um, just basically to keep costs down and cover crops always working well with getting the soil better, obviously. So this is a, a cover crop of beans, rye and vetch. Um, I grow the vetch purposely. If the frost takes the beans out, the vetch will soak up the nutrients, hopefully, so the nitrogen isn't getting wasted. It's still there waiting for my following crop. I try to farm as biologically as possible, always using biology first, and then fungicides, insecticides afterwards. I haven't used any insecticides for the last five years. This year, I didn't do a T0 fungicide. I did a little bit of T1 on some of the wheat. I didn't do a T2, and I did a T3 on some of the wheat. So I'm always trying to drive down, but I'll always try and use biology first and keep fungicides as a backup. That's the, one of the root systems of one of the bean plants this time. So you can see the aggregates, you can see the biology's working in there. Um, so for me, the, the whole system's working. I'm keeping any nitrogen that was left over with the rye growing and the beans. So it's just keeping the whole system functioning. It's always what I'm trying to do is just keep everything fun functioning, get a healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy people. That's a dry matter report of, um, of the beans of that crop. Um, I don't know whether you can see very well, but I'd got basically 242 kilos of nitrogen. An awful lot of nitrogen, but it was just keeping it there for the next crop. I think probably that year I lost an awful lot of volatilization. Um, I didn't manage to cycle it that well. So the following year, I've incorporated sheep to, to, to basically make that crop into a fertilizer ready for the next crop to use. It worked really well. Um, the money I had from the grazing of the sheep paid for the seed, so it's all the while making the whole system sustainable and not adding extra costs to the farm. I never graze down low, so I'm always trying to 50% or 30% left of the crop, so I don't get the poaching. It carries the sheep really well, and um, it works, and then hopefully that will just start and grow again and keep those nutrients cycling until I go in and drill my spring barley. That's just, just showing the spring barley coming up. Um, and I just wanted to show I'd still got that understory of cover there, and hopefully just, just holding it all together. I use a lot of biology, so when I'm drilling, I'll, I'll brew up... Um, bacillus, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and trichoderma. 
So I'm always trying to, to, to try and fight disease and release all those nutrients because when you've got bacillus and you've got trichoderma, if your soil isn't quite there to have the mycorrhizae starting to come back in, it's, it's a very, very close brother. So it's, it's doing the same thing for you. It's releasing those nutrients so you're getting the plants off to a really good start. And as Andy said, it's five pound a hectare. Why would anybody not want the free nitrogen? I, you know, I can always guarantee I get 40 kilos and I've had a lot more. Um, one, the first year I tried it, I did it as a foliar. Uh, I reduced my nitrogen on my wheat by 40 kilos to the hectare just to cover the cost of the, of the nitrogen fixing bacteria because at that time I wasn't brewing. I was just using it straight, so it costs a lot more. And where I'd, where I'd done the trial, I, I'd got an extra ton of wheat per hectare compared to my conventionally drilled wheat. So th that was the first year I did it and it was a real success, which then got me even more interested into brewing and bringing the whole process down and making the whole thing cheaper. This was a barley trial I did last year. It doesn't show up very well. Um, the side to the left is done totally with biology. So at drilling, the biology went down the spout next to the seed. I didn't use any fungicides. I just brewed up bacillus to fight disease. An awful lot of tissue testing to make sure we'd got the plant balanced, the right nutrition, so disease shouldn't be coming in. I used 40 kilos of nitrogen per hectare on the left-hand side. The right-hand side was, was about 90 and um, disease wasn't, there wasn't, you couldn't see any difference between the two. It was, it was, it was fan fantastic really to, to, for me to see it all happening and not to be using the fungicides and not to have spent the money on, on uh, nitrogen. That was one of the tissue tests that I had done just for my own fascination really, just to see what was really going on in my own head, just to see that it was working. The left-hand side is the applied nitrogen. The right-hand side is the all the biology, and as you can see, that you know there's no difference between the two, um, except the fact I was saving 50 pounds to the hectare with the biology treated, and obviously by not using the fungicides, I was getting far better healthy soil, and it was sitting right with me that I was farming far more environmentally friendly. That's the combine yield monitor, and the trial is down that sort of blue line there. It's a little bit lighter that side of the field, which is why it's a little bit bluer on the right-hand side, but as you can see where the barley trial was, the, the, you know, there's no real difference. The combine didn't show it any real differences going across it. The quality of the barley was better. I got bolt in on that bit. Um, so this year I've done a lot more, but uh, it was a win-win for me. Again, that's not a very good slide, but that um, is a trial I've got going this year. The left-hand side has only had 100 kilos of nitrogen by using biology as well. The right-hand side is my conventional, which is 180 kilos of nitrogen. That, I mean, the 180 is reduced from where I used to be by purely using a carbon source when applying my soil applied. And as Andy does, I, I do leaf test a lot just to top up with foliars if I need to, and just monitoring the crop constantly. That one will be interesting to see this time, just to see what the combine says really with the yield monitor. Are my soils starting to cycle a lot better and I don't need to be applying the 180 or am I just pushing my luck too far? I don't know. But unless we do these trials and unless we do them ourselves, I don't see as anybody's gonna do it for us. And it's something, you know, I think every farm should be doing a trial just to see what's happening because every farm's different and none of us know for sure what's going on because it's all new, but I can assure you no fertilizer company's gonna do this work for us. You know, it's gotta come from us. And that is, I put cover crops in 50% because I'm 50% um, spring cropping. But that was just really just to show how that cover crop, that's had no input from me at all. That's just growing naturally and just soaking up all that excess nitrogen, which will then be cycling into my next crop. So uh, it, it's just, we just put that in really just to show how everything is cycling and working on the farm. And that's me, and Joe hasn't given me the T sign, so I've done well. <laughs> Good evening, um, I'm Doug Christie. I farm in Fife in Scotland on 300. Speak closer to your mouth. Oh, I've, I've, I farm in Scotland over 300, um, 500 hectares in total. Can I have the, uh, that's it. The, um, a third of the farms 
livestock-based organic production, um, the only things I buy onto that part of the farm, import onto the farm, are minerals, balls, and occasionally seed and a bit of maggoty sulfate. It is totally sustainable, if you want to use that word. Um, in an ideal world, I'd like to take that to the, all the rest of the farm, but just for, some, for, for various reasons, I can't ramp up ni livestock numbers con considerably, but that's possibly something to look at in the future. The, the rest of the farm, two-thirds of the farm, are about just over 300 hectares of um, stockless arable rotation, and over the last since um, for the last 20 years, majority of that land hasn't been ploughed, and over the last six, seven years, I've been direct drilling it all. The main, the main reason for, um, for looking at reducing nitrogen is, as Andy said, the, the um, I'm finding it's probably a driver for pests and diseases, and I've and I've and I've seen that in under an organic situation, growing crops on an organic situation after five years of grass, for example, there's virtually no disease in those crops, in spring barley or the oats, and I can get up to sort of two tons an acre average on those crops, um, and it beats me up why on the conventional side. I've got to put all this nitrogen on. As soon as you put the nitrogen on, you've got to spray the fungicides, you've got to put the, um, and, and the weeds get out, the noxious weeds get out of control, the, um, which I, is not really a big problem in the organic side. Can I have the next slide, please? This is, this is a rough idea of the nitrogen use over the last 10 years. Um, I have, I've not been nearly as successful as reducing nitrogen on the conventional part of the farm as, as Tim and Andy, and I'm probably a good reason why I'm third on the lineup of speakers tonight. <laughs> um, but over the whole farm, and this is including the, the, the organic part of the farm, I am slowly beginning to reduce the amount of um, nitrogen, bought in nitrogen on the farm. Last year was a slight anom anomaly. Um, the right-hand column here is the kilograms of nitrogen used per tonne of output of the cereals. Now, that's not taking account of the livestock exports off the farm, but it gives a rough idea it has been going down, uh, and that's, this is taken as a whole farm basis. The outputs, um, the, so that's probably the, that's the most important line to look at at the end there, um, and that's the average kilograms per hectare used of nitrogen over the, over the last 10 years. The farmyard manure created by the cattle have not been included in these calculations on the right column. Is it possible to move on to the next slide? Um, the ways I've been managing to do this, or it, it's it's becoming higher up on my list of priorities, is reducing the nitrogen. Now, this is me 20 years ago. I don't really do things by halves. I like jumping in and not doing, and, um, and I've learned quite heavily from my mistakes in the past in, in, in trying new things, because I've, I've gone headfirst into a lot of things. But this is me starting off um, direct drilling or, or um, shallow cultivations and drilling to, uh, to 20 years ago. Next slide, please. Um, so direct drilling has been one reason why I've been um, being able to reduce the nitrogen use. One of the other facets is basically the facets covering um, regenerative agriculture as a whole. So having living roots in the soil at all time is, ve is, is very important. Um, this is a crop, a companion cropped last year of oats, oilseed, rape, and spring peas. Um, it did reasonably well, but that crop I 
put 20, 20 kilograms a hectare of nitrogen on in total, no fungicide, and a very small amount of herbicide. Um, and it shows, just shows what you can, what you can, and no insecticides. I've not used any insecticides on the farm for 20 years. It just shows what you can do um, without much in the way of inputs. So, and the crop, the crop all the way through the year looked very healthy. There was a slight divergence in the um, harvesting dates, but um, luckily, with a wing and a prayer, I managed to get it all harvested without too much dropping on the ground. So that's incorporating diversity and living and living roots into the soil and, and soil cover um, as maximizing that on the farm. Is it possible to shift across? Yeah. Also is living roots throughout the year. So as Gabe Brown says, what, um, what did he say in North Dakota? Is, it's, I empathize what he, was, what he said, um, carbon drives everything. So I'm, pri I'm trying to begin to prioritize getting carbon into the soils as much as possible. So this is a multi-species cover crop grown last winter in Scotland. This is exceptional in Scotland. It's not, this is, um, most years the cover crops get to sort of an inch high and then, they, then, it's, then it gets quite cold. So this produced um, uh, 16 and a half tons a hectare of uh, fresh weight and 1.65 tons a hectare of dry matter. Uh, I could have, I could have, that's a 10 hectare field. I could have grazed 25, 30 cows on that field for a, for a month. Um, and that, is it possible to shift to the other, to the next slide? That's the, um, that's the analysis of that crop. So I chopped, chopped it all up with, with a pair of scissors and sent it away for analysis. analysis. And that is just basically, I, put, I sow, sowed the crop with using home safe seed and um, I wish I could get analysis like this in every crop. Um, unfortunately, on some of the, um, the cash crops I grow, it's not nearly like this. Um, but the 70 kilos of that crop is uptaken into the, in, into the shoots, 70, roughly 70 kilos a hectare of nitrogen, 70 kilos a hectare of potash, which hopefully, which will be um, available for the next crop at some stage. But it's, it's, it's a dark art, try well, it, for me, it's a dark art trying to see when it's available. It, and it's more often more available roughly at this time of the year rather than earlier on in the spring. We had a very cold spring earlier on. Um, the species mix in that was mostly home safe seed. And it was linseed, pea, uh, linseed beans, oats, um, some radish and mustard and some vetch. Rotation is also very important in the farm. I've shortened my, being able to reduce nitrogens um, now has, I've used, I've shortened the rotation to be able to uh, reduce the nitrogen. So I have a break crop every three years now rather than every four or five years, which I used to have originally. So the rotation is basically wheat, barley, and then a break crop. And I'm including legumes a lot more in the break crops that I used to. I used to grow a lot of winter oilseed rape, that rape and that's, I'm doing less so now. I'm not doing any winter oilseed rape now, but I'm, Every, every break crop includes a leg, legume of some sort, whether it be beans or, or um, peas or, ve or vetches. And also, at every opportunity, I'm, I'm hoping to get a, a cover crop over the winter prior to spring cropping, and that, those cover crops also in, in, include leg, legumes. Um, next slide, please. And I spoke briefly about the organic side of the farm, but um, I'm just beginning to trial, um, try mob grazing at a very primitive scale. That's a very big paddock for those 70 cows and calves and two bulls, but um, it's a very steep learning curve and certainly a no-brainer if you're moving straight from um, set stocking. And I think that's it, thank you.
Thank you very much. Okay. Yep. So um, and we're going to rapid fire through these. Um, so I'm mindful of time. So as I mentioned, I just want to share a few just other ideas from a few other farmers that, uh, and if any of you are in here, the audience today, feel free to chime in and add more details. Some of these I don't have a, a final um, result on, uh, outcome. Uh, I just, again, sharing some I, some I have some results, some I just have the ideas or the strategy of what they're, uh, what the, the farmer is trying. So I'm mindful that we had a uh, very dominant of arable croppers here, but I'm glad to hear that um, we had some livestock integration coming in. But I did try to have a, a livestock farmer up here, um, but the two that I asked uh, couldn't quite make it. So um, again, a couple of other examples, perhaps on the livestock half. Uh, this is Rob Drysdale from Horsham. Purchased and being reduced by two-thirds over the past two years. Also, output quality of grass is, is up. It's still early days, but silage is already 2 to 3% up in protein and about 10% up in yield on a second cut despite dry conditions. Key strategies used was lots of composting, lots of strategic compost spreading, tie and harrowing, overseeding with clover uh, for end capture, and targeted use of sulfur. Okay, so again, I don't have all of the details and specifics. I'm just throwing all sorts of various ideas uh, out that I've had here. Okay, Thomas Stobart uh, from Cumbria. Again, this was made grazing infrastructure was his strategy here. Techno grazing has been the main tool that we've used to reduce our N, better budgeting of grass, uh, higher farm cover, and therefore grazing further uh, and longer into the season. Nitrogen as a feed supplement also has consequently been reduced. Okay, Sam Vincent, another farmer that partly went organic as well as one strategy to reduce nitrogen. Main change, however, was from adopting also mob grazing. So there's another theme here, uh, picked up from reading Joel Salatin, of course. Uh, as well as fertilizer, we've cut many inputs. Uh, Sam mentioned particularly P and K has come down, uh, including concentrates for the animals. Now we're only feeding dairy cows some basic concentrate and the young stock also uh, on, on, on all pastures. This is Michael Leyland, uh, use of cover crops and um, ahead of cereals. So intentional use of covers there prior to those cereals in the rotation. Also a shift in the crop choice. Um, Simon Cowell replied to this, but I haven't included him here because we'll chat with him tomorrow. But his, his, his thoughts was also crop choice uh, is also a key strategy here to also be lowering that nitrogen. And I heard this theme of cutting out oilseed rape from a couple of you. I know Andy's done a bit the same. But um, so shift from winter to spring barley, going from 200 down to 150 kgs of nitrogen, now looking towards spring oats and a further reduction down to 110 kgs. Uh, more grass in the arable rotation. So again, fertility lays and uh, herbal lays, etc. But in bringing the, the grasses into the arables, um, integrating livestock, and then the following cash crops, of course, receiving less nitrogen. And composting, this was been a big, big one for Michael. He spoke uh, or wrote to me in detail about various things he's using and really getting quite into the composting of his manure side of things. So, you know, much more intentional, active management of that manure resource, um, turning and uh, producing a better quality compost as one key tool. So he was, um, spoke at length about composting as, as a key tool. Now, this one I'm going to share. This one's Jamie from Shetland. Um, sent me some very ex um, extensive information on foliar urea trials that he's doing. So I'm just going to share a little bit of his. He gave me quite a lot of information. I'm just going to try and summarize it as quickly as I can. But his key strategy that he was playing around with was foliar urea. And also, he's done a foliar K trial. And then also the integration of carbon. Again, a theme that we've heard a little bit already today, bringing carbon base into the mix of the fertilizers. So he, I'm just going to share some of his results from three tram lines that he did. Um, so uh, one was a potassium folia, uh, tram line one. And tram line two was uh, the control, no folia. And tram line three was potassium as well as a urea base. Uh, so potassium and nitrogen and carbon. So next slide. I've got to some of his kind of results quickly here. So these are some plate um, readings. And generally, so if you just remember here, tram line one was potassium, two was control, three was potassium and urea. So you can see just on a couple of different dates here, looking at his plate readings, you can see that you know that extra component there, the third treatment here, he's got higher there, also 
higher here, 400, 800 versus 4,100. And down here, a bit later on in the season, 6,300 versus 5,500, these kinds of figures. Uh, he's also got some kind of cuts, um, weights here on his swath. So you can see here uh, the control, 200. He bumped up to 225 when he had the foliar K, and then went up to 265 with K and the nitrogen. I should say he's got very low K soils. That's kind of why he was playing around with the potassium, very light sandy soils that he struggles to kind of hold on to that potassium. Um, okay, and then just some other figures uh, on here. If maybe I'll just cut to the summary, I'm mindful of time. So yield differences, uh, the control in the middle here, we can kind of see where he's integrated the K uh, in terms of dry matter yield um, and uh, proteins and sugars here. So you can see a couple of them um, jumping up here and where he's had the K and the nitrogen, perhaps some slightly larger increases further. So, you know, mixed bag of results there, but okay, he's seeing that the effectiveness of the foliar spray as a strategy to get the nutrition in and to help drive overall um, plant, plant health and production. Okay, so foliar rear was another topic that came up. Uh, this was one from Ireland here, Leslie Dwyer, who was um, in silage, saying that he's seeing equivalent response from 25 kgs of foliar versus 125 being applied down onto the soil. Uh, he was also playing around with some slurry treatments and biological end fixes. I don't have any details on that, but they were part of, again, an, in, an integrated strategy. Fertilizer coatings was another one. Uh, this is Philip Reck, also from Ireland, trying with uh, seaweed and humates, so a carbon source, coating the fertilizer granules. Okay, I don't have any follow-up, Philip. I don't know if Philip's here today, but um, I don't have any. This is, I know he's trialing this kind of this year. So again, I'm just throwing different ideas out at you, carbon-based to that nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, George Hosier uh, from down in uh, Wiltshire. So cereals, he's seen a 10 to 20% reduction in nitrogen um, via combining with carbon. So using molasses, carbon base uh, with his nitrogen inputs and then dialing down those nitrogens. On his all seed rape, he's achieved a 30% reduction. Same deal, combining with carbon, uh, but also adding a, an additional companion, a legume companion, vetch or beans. So again, uh, you know, we're seeing these recurring themes trickling here of these 10 and 20, these kind of gradual step-down reductions. I think this is a very good strategies that we should all be thinking about. Okay, and then Fred Price um, did sent me uh, some quite a lot of, he really took this approach of fine-tuning his soil and tissue analysis, doing a lot of really real-time kind of micromanaging. Again, if Fred's here, he can chime in as, when we have a discussion, but again, carbon molasses base to his nitrogen inputs, also foliar substitutions. Again, more recurring themes here. He's also integrated cover crops, mixed lays, perennial forages, and pigs, bringing pigs and using uh, them, of course, as part of the uh, arable rotation. He was stepping down in 20% increments, uh, and he's basically gone from 220 to 250 kgs of nitrogen per hectare down to 80 for wheat and 40 for oilseed rape. And I think Fred's got the right idea. Again, I don't want to <clears throat> I don't want to delay us too further, but I can see um, some beer and soil, um, two two very important and interesting themes that we also need to go and explore uh, later on at the um, at the earthworm arms. Okay, I think that was my last one. Okay, it was. So, if we can um, grab everybody up for a quick discussion, um, all I just want to do is ask a few questions for everybody, and if you can each give me your answers and open it up to the floor, I really would like to hear from the audience to ask these guys, draw on their experiences, what they've done, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and uh, to, to kind of carry on the discussion here. Okay, so we heard a lot of different things. There's been a few recurring themes that um, I jotted down. Oh, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Yes, we can grab both of those. Forgot that. Here I am with my microphone, but, and then I have to steal one of those back off you before we ask questions. Okay, so um, I think let's ask, maybe start with just a very quick general question. You know, this whole topic of soil health, it's very much on the agenda and the radar um, these days. Uh, thank you to events like this, and we can see how many attendees this event keeps growing from strength to strength, and there's such engagement in the topic of soil in recent years, and we're all very aware, aware of this to the point sometimes where some of us maybe even get a bit sick of hearing about soil health, I, I dare say it. But um, just curious to know, perhaps from uh, our panelists here, what was there a particular light bulb moment or a particular something that happened to you, a talk that you went to, a book that you read, something you saw in the field that kind of really sparked your interest in soils and in, in soil health. Was, it, was there a particular something that kind of kicked this off for you in any order? 
for me, reading your old boss's book, from Graham Sait, mm -hmm. um, it just completely opened my eyes. I always thought, if you've got disease, you need fungicide. And having someone, he did a series of interviews, he's about 15, 20 years old, this book is called Nutrition Rules. Mm -hmm. And it, it suddenly conflicts a switch in my mind, thinking, well, actually, no, a lot of things we're doing on the farm are our, our own fault. So that, that book from Graham Sait was probably the one that was the biggest switch for me. Awesome. For me, <coughs> I've always been interested in soil, um, and I started just to notice how our soil was degrading and how I was putting more and more inputs on, um, and I just thought there's got to be a better way. Um, soil is such a finite resource, it's, you know, it's so valuable. Without soil, we're all dead, it's, it just, and I just wanted to look after it more. And, because I got really nerdy about it, the more I looked into it, the more I got into it, and the more I wanted, and it just stems from there, really. I just, once I got on the subject, I couldn't leave it alone, so that's just me. <laughs> awesome. I think um, when I started maybe 20 years ago of direct drilling, it was more out of laziness, and laziness and um, um, getting incredibly bored going up and down a field plowing that um, prompted it. But, it morphed into something else, and 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 I start. Then I started with cover cropping and uh, trying around a bit of cover cover cropping and so on, and and mix and mucking around with the rotations. But the real light bulb bulb moment was going and seeing some of these very far sort of outward thinking, out of the box thinking farmers in the in North Dakota in the states, and that really made me realize what I was aiming for. Now I know my, my end game now. I've, I've got a very good, clear understanding of what my end game, it, game is now. I've got a long way to go, and I make lots of mistakes still, but um, I am confident in the way I'm going is, 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 is the right way, and hopefully will improve the, the margins on the farm in the future, as well as soil health. Yeah. Nice. One of the, I mean, just on that point there, Doug, one of the uh, criticisms perhaps is um, when we draw information or, you know, experiences from abroad, you know, different countries, different contexts, this is often, as we're all aware, often picked up as a negative, but for some people, I mean, for you there, you, you saw something that clearly very captured your imagination. You were able to translate that back, obviously not directly, but you were able to translate that back to... Oh, translate, and, and, and it, it's the same, it's same principles apply there it's uh, as here and okay you, you've you, you've got to tinker with it a bit if you're bringing principles across from there but mm. it was more the more the mindset and the thinking behind what they were doing it was some of these farmers backs were against the wall for a few years and um, they had to radically change there was no out of the bot out of the out of a box um, mm. solution to it they had to think of their way to get out of the fix they were in themselves mm -hmm. um, and, and it opened up a whole new um, vision of how, how sort of to go about farming in the future. Okay. And Tim and Andy, both of you, one of the commonalities that popped up in your discussions here was the role of, of plant monitoring, sap monitoring, and various kind of plant monitorings. This was a, a, a key kind of theme that they both discussed. I think uh, Andy kind of raised the very good point there. It's, it's giving you that assurance there. You're, you know, as you're beginning this process of dialing down those reductions of that inputs, we can still be using monitoring the plant, asking the plant directly, and um, you know, checking our progress through, through that. So good to see you both there um, kind of using those tools. It, is there anything particular that you have found or that you could elaborate on in, in kind of what your experiences of using that, directly managing the plant itself? Or? I think the thing for me, the, the one real astounding thing is that the less N I put on, the higher the bricks reading, or every time. And just okay. the plant's just healthy. The disease isn't there when I haven't put the nitrogen on it. But it's just getting that balance. And I'm not saying I can farm with no nitrogen. It's just finding the balance, the sweet point of where we, where we want to be. And we'll get there. I mean, my philosophy is we can solve every problem. We just haven't thought of it yet. And you just got to keep driving. And as I keep saying, trials, trials, trials. We've all got to do trials. Mm. But that, yes. it's, the more we keep, the more we can learn. And if we can share what we're learning, it's even better because it saves us all having to go through the same pain because you know, we've, I've had loads of balls ups, but you can't give up. This is our future. And we've just got to keep pushing at it because we will get there. Thank you.
Anything you want to add, Andy? Uh, in terms of the sampling, I'd say they're all very useful, but by themselves, you can't hang your hat on one thing. I mean, bricks is great, but just because you've got bricks over 12 doesn't necessarily mean you can go on holiday for three weeks. You've got to take it in context of the weather, the temperature, um, the cropping, the date. Um, so I, that's why I use three or four, and I do the tissue testing that Tim does as well. And I think you have to look at it as a trend over the years, not necessarily um, something you can't take one year and think, wow, or, oh no, this is going wrong. You've got to start looking at trends from year to year and hope you'll see a gradual improvement. And um, that's what I take from the tissue testing. Mm -hmm. And I think with the tissue testing, you can test one day. I don't know whether you found this, Andy, but you can test two days later when the biology is actually working and it'll be a different result. The, the biology has such an influence on the plant, but the temperature has such an influence on the biology. And that's, as Andy says, it's all pieces to the jigsaw that we're both using to get to the full puzzle. Mm -hmm. And it's you just never stop, really. And it's, it's experience every year. I don't know whether you find it, Andy, but you just keep learning little bits to the puzzle every year. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the other commonality that came out of both of yours was the foliar and, and this carbon addition, and that came through in some of our other case studies. How important do you see that addition of carbon as a base to, to your fertilizer inputs, I mean, particularly nitrogen, but even more generally? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't apply nitrogen without adding a carbon source. It's, um, I've done trials in my garden where I'd use a good nut carbon source. I mean, I use nurture, but boost or anything, but... It's, it's there and it feeds. I mean, when I've used Nurture, which has got the fulvic and the humic acid in, it just feeds the biology. The biology just becomes alive. And I've done a trial this year on the, my lawn. It's still, we've mown it three or four times and it's still as green as green. And it's just proof all the while because it's all different. So it just proves it in my head. But I wouldn't apply nitrogen without a carbon source because I'm keeping my nitrogen. Why do I want to let that just run and pollute everywhere when I'm spending good money on it? I want to keep it as long as I can and utilize as much as I can and reduce what I'm putting on because the more I'm putting on, the more damage it's doing. And if I can keep everything down, the, the whole picture is just getting healthier. So I wouldn't do nitrogen without carbon source. Yeah, it's, for me, it's the efficiency. It's also when you understand that when you apply nitrogen, it's going to be used carbon from your soil. And as, we've, as you said, carbon drives everything. If you're using lots of nitrogen with no carbon, you're losing your soil carbon. So if you're trying to get soil organic matters up, it's very difficult unless you're losing lots of compost. If you're going to put 300 kilograms of nitrogen on, you'll be losing stuff up and you know, it'll be going because you're losing nitrogen. I did hear a, someone told me that for every, every kilogram of excess nitrogen you use, you lose 100 kilograms of carbon from your soil. That seems quite excessive, but even if it's 10, you know, for every excess kilogram of nitrogen you use, you lose 100 kilograms of carbon. That soon can mount up. So for me, adding the carbon is essential. Okay. All right, and we've heard a little bit of what you're all doing, so perhaps a quick comment. We'll open it up to the floor, but before we do, perhaps a quick comment from each of you on, on where to next. You know, what are your, what are your, is there any new strategies in the pipeline, or what is the next tweak or refinement that you're looking at uh, integrating for all of you? <laughs> you can start, Doug, if you like. <laughs> Give these guys a break for a second. <laughs> Not necessarily. I think I'm on the right. But as long as I'm, I'm, the main thing I've got to remind myself: following the four sort of precepts of regenerative agriculture, or whoever, whoever, however much you want to call it, is just keep keep the soil covered, keep living roots in the soil at all times, um, and and diversity, getting as many plant species into your rotation as possible, and um, hopefully. Carbon, the soil carbon res uh, um, reserves will 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 increase over time, mm. but um, I do want to go. I do want to take the compost thing further, and I want to dig a lot more, add a, add a lot more compost with the farmyard manure that I make, and maybe adding wood chips into that, and experimenting with with that. I haven't. I'm way behind a lot of other farmers on this front, but um, that's the next step. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, for me, I guess the next step is to increase the intercropping because I've just seen, as you just said, diversity, the diversity of the rotation, but diversity within the field. It's amazing when you start mixing things together. It doesn't always work brilliantly, but the disease disappears, the need for fertilizer disappears. It, it, for me, it's the one thing. If we can get the technological, technological things correct and learn how to do it, 
it's going to be a game changer, but it's not necessarily simple. So for me, it's increasing the amount of intercropping. Mm. Nice. Um, well, for me, but I'm increasing my cover crop mixes. I'm up to 11 species this year. I'd like to get up to 20. Um, and then the big one for me is just to get an understory of clover growing all the while. So I've got that constant feed, interaction with the biology and the fungi to keep it going, but also that hopefully that nitrogen coming back to feed the crop. So that's my big one is, is just to get clover growing constant. Can I just can I just also um, add the importance of livestock, um, and I, I think there's an enormous scope there on arable farms to integrate a lot more livestock into the farm because they're the they're the driver of my sustainable sort of organic part of the farm. I don't buy anything and I don't buy any nitrogen in, but um, I think there's a huge part for them to play in conventional farms, uh, mopping up cover crops. Um, and even using summer cover, cover crops as break crops and um, re reducing weed burdens over the years because we've got ourselves into this um, scenario. We've got a lot of weeds out there which are very difficult to control and livestock have got to have an integral part to be able to, um, to address that problem. Okay, thank you very much all. That's excellent. Um, well, okay, can you do the honours? Any questions from the floor? There is one um, just straight up the back there. Any others while I'm gazing? Any other hands? Just for next. Okay, a couple up the front. Okay. Oh, we on? Uh, gentlemen, fascinating. Um, just one question. You're on about adding carbon sources to fertiliser. How do you add carbon to a granulated fertilizer, and what do you do, and how do you do it? Uh, this is a question I had a long time with when Joel came five years ago, and it's taken me till this year to work it out. Um, we did try, a Spanish company were doing a carbon-coated, um, a humate-coated fertilizer, but the problem is you wouldn't come out of the spreader because it was all sticky, sticky, so that finished. But what I do is, on our self sprayed sprayer, um, I put a slug pellet on the front, a good slug pellet, and I buy boron humates, and that's getting spread out the front when I'm going with the fertilizer, and the fertilizer's coming out the back. So they're getting spread together, and the boron humates, I use them because they don't disintegrate and they will throw 24 meters. So that's, that's how we've managed to do it. It's a lot easier if you're liquid because you just add in five liters of molasses or nurture. But um, yeah, with granular, it has taken a bit longer to work out. There was the case study that I quickly showed, so also using liquids to coat the granule. So Philip Breck there had that example of the seaweed and humic coated. So there's, uh, I know a few people in North America who are playing around with the liquid carbon sources and like you would add, you know, your nitrification inhibitors, agritane or whatever, that they will also add a liquid carbon component uh, to that granule and, and mix it all around. Um, obviously, you're being a bit careful of the carbon component if it is too sticky and whatnot, but um, I know there are people over in North America also using liquids. Yeah. Okay, there was a question here. Any other? Uh, next one while I'm gazing. No, okay. We'll see you in a minute. Um, it was a question to all three, really, broadly based around the carbon source as well. And that we've, one of your case studies, Joel, that you put on from Twitter was using molasses, and uh, Andy and Tim are using sort of other products or, or humates. We've, had, we've tinkered with both at home, literally just tinkered and not sure of it yet. I've heard that molasses is more of a bacterial type food, and if we are trying to encourage more fungi in our soil, which will be heavily bacterial at the minute, um, is there any advice, you know, which, which is better, or from a nitrogen point of view, does it not actually matter what carbon we put in with the, with the nitrogen? Mm. Does anyone want to tackle that? <laughs> uh, I can tackle that to some extent that, yeah, if you're trying to encourage, most arable soils will be short in fungi, so you will want to have the humates and humix and the fulvics in the carbon you're using. They're also longer chained, so they're probably more likely to hold on to the nitrogen, I presume. Or they've got a bigger CEC. Um, the other worry of molasses is, yes, it's a bacterial food. And if you're doing that four or five times in the season when you're applying nitrogen, that could be too much of a good thing. Um, so you don't necessarily want, if you're doing molasses, don't necessarily do it too often. But there's good products out there that aren't molasses based. They might be slightly dearer, but you might get a better result from my point of view. 
It's, it's something that concerned me was putting all this sugar on anyway, so it's why I use fermented molasses more now because it's already been broken, fermented, so the biology's done the job, but it's such, because it's got the humic and the fulvic, but the, even the fermented molasses is such a good biological food. It, I've proved it in my own garden, as I said, by just doing trials. It, the, it just feeds the biology far better. I haven't got all the scientific data behind it, but I was never keen on putting all the sugar out there, but the fermented molasses, for me, is just a far healthier way of doing it because it is food rather than just sugar, because sugar doesn't do any of us any good, in my opinion. So. It, it, for me, in my own head, the fermented molasses just, just works. Um, I, uh, yeah, sorry. Do you have anything, Doug, or not? To add on that? Or? I don't, sorry, I, I, haven't, I haven't added any carbon no. sources to my yeah. thing, so I can't, I'm yeah. not qualified to... I, um, I would chime in that I, I think a, the word diversity has cropped up a lot already. I think a diversity of carbon sources is also a good strategy. You want to encourage different groups of microbes at different times, so I think a bit of them all is, is a, a very good strategy to, to, to be considering. And I'd say that fungi can still feed on molasses, and they can, it's just that bacteria, they go, they're quite fast at it, so they do kind of outcompete it, but it's not to say that fun, fungi can't necessarily feed on it either. But, my opinion, I would say a bit of diversity is good in terms of carbon sources as well. Okay, any, any other burning questions? Okay, one here, any others? Okay, we might make this the last one and um, then we'll go have a beer. Thank, thank you, sort of nitrogen related. Traditionally, we're talking, we talk a lot about nitrogen sulfur balance um, for crops and we haven't, whilst we've mentioned trace elements, we haven't mentioned the sulfur element. Mm -hmm. So if you're reducing nitrogen, how are you dealing with that or do you perhaps not think it's important? I personally have kept my sulfur up, so I haven't, I, I suppose I always put a bit more sulfur on them, what RB209 would say anyway, because I just think it's needed. Um, and then I'm monitoring the tissue test to see what I'm getting. So I haven't reduced my sulfur, I've increased it probably. Well, I have, I have increased my sulfur, so. Uh, the same, we use uh, 38 19 urea, ammonium sulfate blend for the first two times through the wheat. Um, so yeah, I think sulfur's important for, as Joel said at the beginning, just for the nitrogen synthesis and getting efficiency. So yeah, I might have reduced my N, but I haven't reduced my sulfur. I used, to, I, I've got very light, light, sandy, loamy soils, so um, potash and sulphur is very important for me, and um, I, I, I put copious amounts of sulphur on both foliar and um, um, granular, but I used to use sulphate of ammonia a, a lot, but now I've switched this year to using um, a potash sulphur blend, which is, which is one of the cheapest forms of potash and sulphur. I found it, it's, it's, I'm gonna try that for a few years to see how that does. But also I, I use a lot of sulphur, Favelia sulphur throughout the year on the crop. Okay, uh, a quick closing comment from each of you. Uh, if you were to offer some advice or uh, from your experience, any advice to anybody particularly new here at Groundswell or new to starting this process of dialing down nitrogen inputs, uh, just a closing comment from each of you of what you would uh, recommend to anyone new to, the, to this process. It's tricky reducing nitrogen, and, um, but I think it's well worth trying even a tram line or two every year, reducing your nitrogen. Last year, I reduced my nitrogen on one tram line for a couple of, I think it was, well, it was like three hectares in total, and um, by 100 kilograms a hectare of urea, which is 46 kilograms of nitrogen on that wheat crop, and yield dropped correspondingly quite significantly, so I lost out about 40 pounds a hectare on, on my sales of that crop because of that. And that's a net 40, 40 pounds a hectare. So um, while I said I like jumping in head first, I think I'd be cautious about, because um, I was thinking my biology, well, might, after doing it for 20 years, might be, my, my biology might be strong enough to, um, to um, counteract the reduction in nitrogen, but that wasn't the case. But um, certainly try, try again and test yourself the whole time to see what you're doing, to make sure that you're doing it right. Don't rely on others to tell you, you can do, you can reduce your nitrogen by 50% in five years of doing cover cropping, for example, just to take a small example, but um, 
just see what you're like on your own farm, because every farm is different. I think I would agree with all that, but that's back to trials. You know, don't jump in, don't go mad, but just keep reducing it. Just have it in your head that you want to get it down and just as many trials as you can do. I, I do probably do too many, but I just get very enthusiastic. But it just, you, everybody's farm's different. So it's no good listening to us and going back and thinking you can just do exactly the same, but just do your own trials. It's in all everybody's interest to lower these inputs. So slowly, slowly, don't go mad, but trials and trials for me and, and share what we get you know let's let's all learn from each other uh, exactly the same do a little bit reduce by 10 percent on one field and see what happens um but the other thing i will add in which hasn't been remembered is regulation i'm pretty sure that if we don't as an industry start to reduce our nitrogen we're going to get told to because the water companies are going to turn around one day and say here's the bill for cleaning the water i was speaking to a water company guy the other day and they reckon it's 200 pound a hectare, the cost of cleaning water from agriculture. If you start getting a 200 pound a hectare bill coming back, you know, so we can focus our mind. Okay, well, um, thank you very much to our three panelists here. Uh, I've scribbled down some notes. I think we've had um, a lot of kind of suggestions have come up here and okay through the Twitter. I mean, cover crops definitely emerged and intercropping. Some very interesting examples there from Andy of zero fertilizer versus uh, with his intercrops versus where he had that treatment. No difference. I mean, that was some really interesting example there. Intercrops definitely in this theme of diversity came through across you all. This foliar nitrogen, foliar is more efficient, avoiding those soil issues. That definitely was a common theme that we saw. And the carbon base, the molasses, the humates, putting these carbon base to, to our fertilizers. Uh, we touched a little on um, uh, nitrogen fixing microbes. We had a little bit of brewing and microbial content. So there's a more and more growing biological products coming on the market. Of course, we will, uh, as we transition our, again, it's important to take a systems approach. So transitioning the whole system and integrating some of those biologicals in, uh, you know, be careful of those direct substitutions. You know, you've got to make the environment, the system favorable for their use. So we heard a couple of uh, nice examples here where there are multiple strategies emerging and, and the biologicals fitting in just as, as one piece of that. Seed treatments we touched on, livestock integration uh, was a, a, a recurring theme there, um, and grazing management. So mob grazing cropped up, cropped up a couple of times, and more grazing infrastructure, fencing, of course, etc., which helps some of that strip and, and mob kind of grazing. Slurry management, of course, manure management, composting, of course, by composting our manures, we're stabilizing that nitrogen with the carbon. So that was the one we had a few examples from that, and keeping the soil covered and maximizing that diversity were perhaps some of the things here that I have scribbled down as strategies that we've heard from, from our panel today. So uh, with that, uh, we will close the session. Um, I've got a gift here from Groundswell, a nice little hand trowel uh, for our um, three speakers here. Um, and we thank you all for your contributions and uh, my Twitter um, friends. Um, and please join me. Thank you.